Hello, I'm Andrew Stephen, the L'Oreal Professor of Marketing, Research Dean, and Director of the Oxford Future of Marketing Initiative right here at the Side Business School at the University of Oxford. I recently had the good fortune to sit down with a friend and colleague, Lex Bradshaw Zanger, who is the Chief Marketing and Digital Officer for L'Oreal in the UK and Ireland. Lex's career has had him work in roles in many companies, including not only L'Oreal, but also Facebook, McDonald's, and advertising agencies. And it's taken him around the world where he's brought his marketing skills and leadership expertise to a range of organizations and cultures. Lex and I had a fairly wide ranging chat about marketing as it is today and where marketing is headed in the future. Talking, of course, about technology and data, but also about the fundamentals and what marketing's purpose really is in organizations and how marketing drives growth. Our conversation was recorded in front of a group of Oxford MBA students who asked some questions along the way. And I began the conversation with Lex by asking him to just tell us a little bit about his career background and really what got him excited about marketing in the first place. So welcome to this morning's marketing deep dive session uh, and actually the very first session of your marketing course on the Oxford MBA. Um, So uh, it's pretty exciting uh, for for me as as a marketing professor that we're now finally getting you into marketing in the program. So, So welcome to that. I'm Professor Andrew Stephen, the L'Oreal Professor of Marketing and the Dean of Research here at Sci Business School. And I'm really, really um, glad to be joined for today's session by by Lex Bradshaw-Zanger, who is the Chief Marketing and Digital Officer for L'Oreal in UK and Ireland. Uh, Lex and I are going to basically have a conversation about marketing and why it matters and, you know, in some sense, the the challenges but massive opportunities uh, that lie in being a very marketing-driven organization. Um, we're going to talk about, I guess, some, some foundational things, but also talk about uh, lots of things relative uh, to the future and, and technology and data and, and exploding media uh, channels and, and, and much more. So uh, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, and Lex, welcome uh, to, to Oxford. It's great to, to have you this morning. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you for the invitation. Good to be here, albeit virtually. I'm not quite in Oxford, but uh, but great to join you. So let's let's begin uh, actually with a little bit of your background. Um, so you know you are the the chief marketing and digital officer at L'Oreal, um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know how you uh, you know got to got to where you are today, and actually what what got you into marketing in the first place. Uh, it's, a, it's a big question for a, for a Monday morning. Uh, you know, while you were speaking, I was trying to think about what my first class in my MBA was like, or my first marketing class. And I can't remember, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but uh, no, so, so maybe I should maybe I should start by saying that I took an MBA and I didn't take any marketing electives. I think I took finance and strategy and I've been trying to catch up ever since. So, so I'm, I'm glad to be with you this morning. I probably should stay longer and, and maybe learn something, but uh, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about, about my career and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and break it down into, into a couple of pieces, you know, because I think w- when we talk about marketing, we sometimes have an agreement or a disagreement about what it means. So, so the first part of my career, almost 10 years, was in the agency world. And I think that's probably communications and not quite marketing because marketing is broader than that. But, uh, you know, I think I, I wanted to be an investment banker. I wanted to be a consultant. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to do lots of different things. And I couldn't quite figure out what exactly was right for me. And then, and then somebody offered me a job in an advertising agency in a, in a brand consultant role, which was basically strategic planning, which is kind of the the intellectual bit of the advertising agency being spun off as a consulting group. And I thought that was really exciting because regardless of what I knew about marketing, I loved brands. And I, and I think I still love brands. And I think that's probably the fundamental piece of, of what drives me. So I spent, I think, almost 10 years in the agency world, in the US, in Paris, uh, in the US again, and then in the Middle East. Uh, and that was quite exciting. And, and I had a bunch of different roles. But overall, I was always the person doing kind of the new stuff. So that tended to be called digital in those days. But I always joked that the digital was the air conditioning as well as plugging in the overhead projector or whatever it was. You know, it's always the person who knows where the source button is on the remote control. So I did that for I did that for about 10 years. Then I was lucky to be recruited by Facebook. I was employee number 26 or 27 at Facebook in France. 
which was super, super small in those days. And, you know, we had double sided and different business cards because we said things are you're the automotive lead or you're the financial services lead or, or something else. Um, so I was with Facebook for a couple of years. And then before L'Oreal, I was with McDonald's. And I think probably McDonald's and L'Oreal are maybe the, the real marketing jobs, you know, really when you're starting to manage all the different levers, all the different pieces. And, I, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But, you know, that was that was really my uh, my my move towards marketing. Well, actually, I was going to ask you, you mentioned, actually, you said, uh, you know, you love brands. What is it about brands that, that you love and why are brands sort of core to, uh, you know, to, to marketing in the way you see it? And actually, if I think about brands, you know, at, at L'Oreal, you know, some of the world's you know, most amazing and, and well-known brands are in, in the portfolio at L'Oreal. And then, you know, you came from McDonald's, which is, again, one of the world's, you know, most well-known and, and recognized and, and loved brands. So I guess you're a brand person, but, but what is it about brands that you, that you love? You know, the thing about brands, and, and this comes back to this sort of this, this role that I was talking about originally, is it, the brand is just a promise to the consumer. It, it, it's something that's quite ephemeral, it's quite virtual, it's quite emotional. And that's what's really exciting because you build all of that with concrete experiences, concrete assets, visuals, images, experiences, and then, and then you build this aura around it. So it's, it's how you take something concrete and create emotion about it. And that's what's, that's what's actually quite exciting about L'Oreal. You know, the, the beauty industry is very, very emotional. You know, we don't necessarily look at specs. You know, when you're buying a laptop, you want to look at the hard drive versus the RAM versus the clock speed. Beauty is such an emotional subject that the brand plays an enormous role there. And so I love that. I love thinking about how the consumer experience is something, how it's connected and how you're building the brand over time through different touch points. So, uh, so I get quite excited about that. And, and, I, and, I, and I have a go at a lot of our marketers about that all the time, because you know, when you're knee deep, ear deep, neck deep in a brand day in, day out, you, you can build a certain amount of fatigue around it but it's not true for consumers. So we have to always remember what the consumer experience is and how we keep building on that. And I think, yeah, and, and constantly reinforcing the, that brand because it, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a really important intangible asset if, uh, if built and, and nurtured and managed in the right way. Um, maybe just building on that then, how, you know, can, can you give us some examples of L'Oreal, how you, how you sort of treat these, these brands as these very important assets? And, and how that plays out across, you know, the whole sort of set of activities that marketers would engage in. You know, I think, you know, every single engagement with the consumer is an opportunity to either build on the brand or deliver on the brand or do both at the same time. And I think, I think the reality is you're always doing both at the same time. So, so at a very fundamental basic level, you know, there's, there's graphical charters and graphical codes that are super important. You know, if you think about our luxury brands, you know, uh, some that the students will know, you know, Lancôme is a, is a very traditional French brand, very, very old. Um, I'll talk about a bunch of brands and some people will be surprised that we're owned by a French company. You know, we've got a lot of American brands, Asian brands and French brands in the portfolio. But Lancôme on the one hand or Kiehl's, which is an American brand. So, so the first piece is kind of graphically what these brands look like. And then you go out from that and you sort of think about, OK, the tone of voice. And then you go out from that and you think about things like I don't know, Marshall McLuhan and the medium is the message. And you think, OK, where do these brands come together? And, and how do we experience them? So every single opportunity is about kind of how do I link the channels together? How do I link the touch points together? And how do I continue to reinforce what it is that I want people to think, feel, understand about the brand? So how does that come to life in, in a digital world? Because, you know, it's not only with, with L'Oreal, but, but L'Oreal is a great example, actually, of, of, a, of a sort of company where the products are very much you know, physical products, their touch and feel, um, and, and it's how, you know, maybe how it makes you feel, but also make, how it makes you look. Um, so, so how does then technology and digital play into um, sort of building uh, those brands and I guess brand experiences when at the end of the day, the, the, the product itself is, uh, or products themselves are a physical, tangible, you know, things. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think there's been a massive evolution there. You know, I don't, I don't know when digital started, probably before you and I were, were on webcasts, but there's been a massive evolution, a massive acceleration over the last 15, 18 months. You know, to start with, digital was just a kind of a channel that people threw content up on. You know, we used to talk about, you know, people taking TV spots and putting them up on YouTube and that didn't work because you don't engage with it in the same way and you don't connect. So there was, there was kind of an audience piece to start with, assuming a content piece to start with. Then you, then you got to this sort of level of, okay, well, now it's about audiences and I can think about specific people and I can tailor the message to them. So, so there's really a piece about communications to start with. It was kind of the first 
the first phase of digital. I think the second piece has been really about, you know, what some people call native advertising, which is sort of going native on, on digital and sort of saying, okay, how do I create things that are specifically developed? And I know, Andrew, you, you like to talk about the acquisition that the group made in 2018. So we acquired a company called Modiface, which is a, a Canadian company. It was one of the leaders in augmented reality. So, so we kind of have two, two parallel work streams with them. So one's called the virtual try-on. So this is everything that you can try on in augmented reality. So makeup was really the first big piece, and then hair color and then nails. So anything where you can use the camera to augment the reality yourself around you and start to test the product. So that was a way for us to bring the product online. The second piece we're doing now is around skin. So it's, it's using deeper technology to analyze your skin. So it's less instantaneous. It's a harder challenge from a marketing point of view because I can look at a photo of you, I can analyze your skin today and I can tell you how greasy, how wrinkly, how gray, how much tension you've got in your skin. And I can look at it over a period of time and I can start to see the evolution. So those are kind of probably the, the two pieces. And then you, you talked about physical products, you're right. So today it's very much about driving to physical products. So how do I explain to people, you know, how to buy this online, where to find it in a store, how to engage with a real human being to be able to kind of make the purchase. But I think now we're, we're at the, the tipping point, I was going to say, I'm not sure at the tipping point, but we're at the cusp of, of something new. And there are two things I think that are, that are relatively new. One is, one is human connections. I think because everybody has gone online, suddenly online has kind of been a bit dehumanized and got a bit gray and mundane, and we need to re-inject humanity. So that's things like one-to-one -one consultations, live streaming, live shopping, all these things where, where I'm actually engaging with an individual, a bit like we are today. So I think that's the first, is sort of re-injecting the humanity online, but in a different way, you know, using the scale of what we have today. You know, we have a lot of BAs, beauty advisors who work for us, and they work in stores. And so they have a geographic footprint, which is the store and the people walking by in front of them. When you put that person online, well, suddenly their scope is completely different. You know, they can they can talk to people who are geographically in the same country or even globally. They can go and talk to people on Amazon and answer reviews. They can do a bunch of different things. So, so we're transforming the way our beauty advisors work. And then I think the next piece, and I'm sure you want to talk about the metaverse at some point today, is kind of what's what's the future? The, the future and the future is eventually, you know, it's, it's, it's the combination of kind of augmented reality, virtual reality, NFTs and, and some company called Meta. You know, I can't call them Meta even if I used to work there. And, and we'll probably get to, at some point, selling products and services in the metaverse. You know, I know that luxury companies are selling handbags as NFTs. We're not quite there yet, but that's, that's probably the evolution. So, so, you know, every phase of digital evolution has an impact on marketing, an impact on the consumer, and we have to adapt to that. Yeah, so we, we will talk about the metaverse. Um, you know, it's, that, you know it's, it's the topic of, of the day, so to speak, when we're thinking about this, but we'll get there. Um, I want to actually kind of take a little bit of a step back. And, and I, I noticed that your job title changed recently from, from chief marketing officer to chief marketing and digital officer or chief digital and marketing officer. I've seen it in different ways. Um, does this just mean you've now got two jobs or um, what, what's going on there? Why, why, why does a CMO now become a sort of chief marketing and digital uh, in, in, a, in a big company like L'Oreal? What's going on? I think, I think there, are, there, are, there are a couple of things. You know, there's an operational component internally within the group and in terms of how we're trying to align roles. And then there's a sort of a, a more philosophical conceptual element about what's happening in the business. So in, in the group, maybe just for, for clarity, we used to have CMOs and CDOs in different places across the business and whether their scope was slightly different at a local, regional, global level. And so we've tried to align that. You know, I think clarity in organizations is, is, is a very important piece. And, and I'm sure you'll ask me about comms versus marketing, you know, my job these days is not just pretty pictures and, and films, but there's a lot of admin that goes on and human elements around marketing, and that's part of part of the job. I think if we think outside, you know, I, I've always believed that digital is not really a thing, particularly when we talk about kind of plugging in projectors and TVs becoming digital. You know, digital strategy is not a thing. I'm going to get ahead of one of your questions for later on. You know, there's there's strategy and then there are tactics. So what we're doing by bringing those together is saying that digital is an intrinsic part of marketing today. And my, and my job is really, my and my direct team is really about two things, you know, marketing excellence, making sure we're really doing what we're supposed to be doing really, really well. A lot of that involves data and measurement and, and optimization. And then marketing transformation. Should we be doing things differently? Should we be integrating things? Should we be stopping things? Both of those are a lot about digital, but they're really about marketing in terms of execution. So I think today, you know, everything is digital. Nothing is digital. The word is losing its value. We need to be more specific. But marketing is very much 
the thing we need to do. You know, we're, we're a marketing organization. We have brands, we have products, and we need to sell them to consumers. Yeah, I mean, I like to think of it as it's, 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 it's digital or, or, or data or analytics or, or technology-enabled business, really, at the end of the day. And, and you know, back to your example before about um, beauty advisors, and, and you know, that, that's a great example, actually, of using technology to facilitate a human interaction that, yes, might have you know, happened face-to-face, uh, historically and, and, and will happen face to face in a physical store, for example, um, you know, into the future as well. But we've seen this sort of expansion of, of opportunities really for, for ways that, that brands can engage with customers. And, and, and when we're using technology, I would argue it, it's not just about replacing the humans or, or you know, putting in a chat bot or something like that. Um, but rather finding ways to, to bring humans together in, in a meaningful and value-creating way, but using technology and, 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 and the good that technology can bring to that. And so I think it's a, it's a refreshing take, I, I suppose, what you're just saying on, on how we want to think about this, where it's not these silos and there's digital off. You know, I've I always joke about, you know, it used to be there's marketing and then you put the digital people in another building somewhere and they have like a cooler office space or something like that. Um, but, but rather bringing these things together and these skill sets together, because frankly, at the end of the day, marketing is about, you know, driving growth in businesses and, and doing that in a human centric way. So, um, whichever channels and tools we use, it, it has to be kind of core to the, to, to the goals of, of, of marketing and, and actually of business, quite frankly. Um, you talked, you talked about putting the digital people off in another building. I think that's always... It's always an amusing one, you know, over, over the last 10, 15 years, I've come across a bunch of digital transformations. Some of them I've been involved in, some of them I haven't, but maybe if I, I won't compare and call out organizations, but our, our previous chief digital officer, Lubomira, who, who you know well, you know, her real commitment was that digital was integrated across the business. It was everywhere in every team. That's a hard task because you're putting these people who are experts, some of them are geeks and nerds, you know, I'd love to be, I'm still a geek and a nerd. You put them on their own, they kind of lose faith and they get lost, but you put them all together and you don't impact the organization. So you've got to find the balance between the two. And that's where L'Oreal has been very successful is putting this digital thing everywhere, but still keeping this community spirit where people can work together, understand each other. And that's what's driven the agility of the business. So let's go a little bit further into that, actually, because it's, it's a, you know, a really great example of over sort of the last seven or eight years uh, of how L'Oreal has really transformed its marketing capabilities to, to bring, you know, technology enabled marketing, you know, into the, into the fold. But that does mean new skills. It does mean new types of roles. It does mean change. And we know change can be uncomfortable. So culturally, how is that played out? Because actually L'Oreal is a perfect example of, of a of a massive global organization that has, I think, done this really, really well. And we've now had almost a decade of, of going through that, that transformation. So we can kind of look back and, and think about it um, a little bit um, more kind of holistically. So how, how has that played out? Um, and, and, and as a leader in, in sort of helping to, to bring digital into, into everything you all do, um, what are some of the, the challenges you've faced in, in making that happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, w- w- when you talk about transformation, you know, if you, if you get a, uh, a white-shirted, gray-suited consultant come in, they'll talk about people, process, technology. Um, I've got the white shirt on, my gray jacket's hanging up somewhere <laughs> else. But, you know, they- they'll talk about people, process, technology. I, I think in-, in the L'Oreal digital transformation, the technology has played the smallest role. Uh, and I think that's-, that's a really important kind of lesson in and of itself, because when we're talking about digital transformation, they say technology is not a big player. It means that people and process really are. So, you know, maybe just those two things or or maybe to to look back on on sort of the last, you know, I've been with the group five and a bit years. So I'll talk about what I know from the inside versus kind of what I've I've read so much. But the people piece is probably the most critical. I would say people and communication. The people piece uh, I talked about before, it's having experts, people who really understand what they're trying to do at different levels of the organization embedded in every team, in every function. You know, we don't just have digital people in marketing. We have them in HR. We have them in supply chain. We have them in finance. So it's across the whole organization, embedded with their teams as part of their teams, but then connected as a community. So that's really important because it means you've got the right people with the right skill sets. There's kind of osmosis into their teams because their their, their initial family is the functional team that they work in, but then they're not lost in the organization because there's a community. So I think that's the first piece, you know, internal and external talent and how it's mixing. 
I think the second piece, though, around communication is, is one thing that, that's been really, really strong at L'Oreal. You know, L'Oreal and, and Lubomira maybe three, four years ago came out with a strategy that was super, super clear. It was, I think it was 20, 50, 100 in those pillars. Maybe it became 30, 50, 100, but it was, it was these three pillars. You know, it was about our e-commerce business. It was about our direct consumer connections and it was about brands or love brands. And that strategy was super, super crystal clear. And even those, you know, as you dig into that, when you're an expert, you can dig in two, three, four, seven levels deep. When you're not an expert, you understand the top line. So everybody was able to take it on board, assimilate it and adhere to it in one way or another. So, so when you mix those two things together, super clear, strong vision, and then the expertise of the teams and the way they were distributed, I think that's what's, what's driven us forward. And then you add to that a little bit of the, the secret source of L'Oreal. So it's not the Big Mac source, but the secret source of L'Oreal, which is the agility, slightly the complexity of the organization, the fact that everybody is very passionate about what they do, very entrepreneurial. You know, you mix all of that together, that creates a very, very strong and positive environment for change and transformation. So really, if, if, if I'm hearing correctly, that last point is really about not changing the culture totally, but, but building off the strengths of the existing culture and, yeah. and kind, of, kind of playing into to sort of the, the DNA of, of what makes the company what it is, that secret source. Plus, you know, back to thinking about the communities. Well, you know, on the one hand, that sounds like creating an even more complicated org chart, but I guess doing it in a way that creates internal networks of people that are both formal and informal uh, kind of structures that, that allow sort of the, the breadth and the depth to, 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 to plug into each other and to work together in ways that make sense to them. Um, and, to, and to really, you know, I would argue also just, you know, what looking, looking at what you've all done is, is to really try and be at the forefront of innovation and, and try and, you know, do some things and some things work, like I'd say virtual try on with augmented reality um, you know, worked and really, I guess, came into its own during lockdowns around the world in the pandemic. Um, but I'm sure there are plenty of other, you know, sort of experiments that that didn't end up being that that uh, successful. But you got to innovate and, and try and give people space to do that um, in an agile way. So, so you know, but I, but the real you know big key point here is as we're talking about technology and digital, you're saying it's about the people. Uh, and it's about you know the, the human aspects uh, in organisations that that really make it happen. Um, which I is... think you know you know you, you talk about the people and, and their skill sets. I think as time goes by, we're also understanding that the complexity of skill sets, functions, skills that we need is getting broader and, and more complicated as time goes by. So you know years ago you would have one I know a, a marketer and a digital expert and they're two ends of the spectrum. The reality is those are growing further and further apart, and we need everybody in between now. So, so it's really a question of evolving skills, evolving experiences to make sure that people kind of put all the different pieces together. Um, there's a book that I love, which is called Range by Epstein, that talks about kind of how uh, you need to have done a lot of different things to really understand what's going on today and, and come at things with different tools. That's really where we are today. You know, marketing has become so complex that you need a bunch of different people with a bunch of different experiences to really crack it. Well, let, let, let's kind of take that that a little bit further and and, and use the sort of the, the, the example of sort of the explosion of media channels that are available to, to brands and marketers uh, in those brands. And so, you know, obviously uh, we've, we've, you know, got the, the, the good old fashioned ones, TV and magazines and newspapers and so on, but we've of course got the various digital ones, but then they keep on changing and, you know, and, and, and it would be probably fair to say also that if we just take Instagram, for example, something that goes, uh, you know, in, in, in the feed on Instagram, you know, in, in, in one way or another is quite a different media channel, certainly a different media format to something that might go in stories or if you're doing something, uh, you know, on reels or so on. And so, so how, you know, thinking about the marketing skills bit and also the need to be agile and innovate, um, but also the fact that, you know, L'Oreal, I, I, would, I would contend in part is very successful because, they're not only great at building um, and growing brands, but they're, they're wise about how they spend their media budgets, which are massive if we think of a global scale. It's one of the world's largest advertisers by spend. So how, how does this all work with sort of the explosion of media channels? Of course, we could add TikTok to the mix now and we can 
you know, we think about the metaverse, you know, this is an endless sort of infinitely growing list of, of places where, you know, your media director and media agencies can think about, you know, putting money. Um, how does an organization, back to your point about saying sort of, you know, your role in part is about marketing excellence. How do you figure all of this out and, and kind of help your marketers with almost a, you know, guidance or a playbook, if you will, around where to invest time and money? No, it's, I mean, that's, that's the, the million dollar question. Um, so you're right. I mean, we're, so we're a very big advertiser, one of the biggest in the UK, one of the biggest globally, and it's, it's one of the bigger lines in, in our spend. So it's critically important. You know, I think there are there, there are lots of ways to, to answer that question or, or to tackle the challenge. You know, to, to start with, I would say we, we always start at both ends. You know, there are there are some fundamentals of media, and I love to talk about fundamentals of marketing, but fundamentals of media that are really important. You know, if we were in a classroom, I, I'd love to I'd love to ask everybody if they know what a GRP is or a TVR and see how many raise their hands because you know, I'm, I'm I'm still too young to remember that. But but I know that GRPs are at least are a combination of reach and frequency. You can't extract the two, but it's really important. It's really important to understand the concepts of reach and frequency. And what's super exciting is that on TV, you can't extract the two, but then when you get onto Facebook and Instagram and digital media, you suddenly get this granularity of, okay, well, this unique reach and this amount of frequency. So suddenly you've gone a level deeper. So that's one of the fundamentals of media, isn't it? You know, understanding how many people I'm touching, how many times I'm touching them. And then we start to talk about audiences. You know, am I touching the right audience with my message? And that works differently on TV because it's about how you pay versus on Facebook or TikTok or, or whoever in terms of how you target. So one end, lots of fundamentals of media, understanding who you're touching the right number of times and how that works together. And then all the way at the other end, it's about really understanding the platform, the experience, how somebody is connecting with the message. You know, you turn it, is it a story? Is it in feed? Is it a video? Is it a static image? Is there text? And so when you start to understand that, then you adapt your message to, to meet that. So, so those are the two ends of, of what we do all the time. You know, we're constantly evaluating our overall media mix and say, okay, are we in different places? You know, there's a lot of studies that show, you know, when you touch a consumer on whatever, two, three, four, five channels, it's more impactful than just a lot of, a lot of pressure along one. So it's important to, to be distributed, but then it's important to not get your money spread so thinly that the marginal returns are not there. And, you know, you end up just kind of spreading it very, very thin. It's like when you've got, only got a little bit of butter on your toast, there's no point putting it everywhere because you can't taste it at the end of the day. So, so that's the, that's the, the, those are the two pieces. But I would say that there's another, there's another big piece, which is data that kind of sits on top of that. You know, what can you measure and how can you measure it? But that's a really interesting space because for a while we were in this utopia of getting to a point where we could measure everything and connect the dots from everybody and we'd have a cookie and we'd know exactly where you were, when you were, on what platform. And then this thing called privacy has suddenly appeared over the last couple of years, thankfully, I think. But, but it's really put a, put a spanner in the works in that sort of utopic digital measurement. And so there's a little bit of a flip back to, to econometrics or, or media mix modeling that I know we've worked on together, Andrew, but this is really kind of taking real hardcore econometrics, statistical methodologies to understand what works. So, so that's kind of an, an overshadowing piece is kind of, okay, once I've really thought about operationally what the right things to do are, then I need to measure and learn from that and adapt the plan. So definitely, you know, this is, this is definitely the, probably one of the biggest questions in, in marketing and media today particularly as, as the proliferation of channels is incredible. And within each channel, you've got different formats, different objectives. You know, what we see at the moment, which is very exciting, is all the retailers becoming a media. You know, as they've grown their traffic to their e-commerce sites or to their websites, you know, it's not, it's, it's been in the news recently. I think that Walmart is now trying to become a media publisher, uh, aiming to be as big as Amazon in the US. This is really the next frontier. But can you imagine, you know, how many retailers there are and therefore how many publishers and how many new walled gardens? So uh, the complexity is exponential and we need some super strong guardrails, guidelines to make sure we can navigate that. Yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, you, you know, you mentioned sort of Walmart moving into that space, but, you know, also mentioned Amazon. But, but actually, I wanted to ask you how, you know, a, a, a big advertiser, you know, like L'Oreal, um, you know, in the UK, but also you know, around the world works with, you know, these, these walled gardens, the, these massive tech companies that essentially, you know, own the vast majority of, of, of uh, you know, advertising, at least in, in digital channels. So obviously we're talking about Meta and we're talking about Google and, and, and increasingly um, Amazon and actually Apple now that, you know, with, 
with the change in in privacy, um, you know, we've seen reports a lot lately about how you know all, all of a sudden Apple's advertising market share has uh, has started to rise. And so, as a as a you know a, a senior executive in in your role, how how do do you work with the the, the tech companies on this? Because on the one hand, I can imagine they just want you to spend more on their platforms, but at the same time, they they don't want you to spend money that gets wasted. Uh, and they're also trying to innovate and figure out how to develop their advertising products. So I guess it's a bit of a, you know, symbiotic relationship in one way or another, but they're all competing uh, as well. So how does, you know, maybe walk us through what that, those relationships then, then uh, look like in, in reality? No, so, so you're right. We, we work with most of the major, if not all of the major players in the, in the digital advertising space, and they are, they're all key partners for us. And, and really the, the word partner is important. So yes, it's a commercial relationship where you spend money, but you're right, they're evolving very fast and, and being a partner is critically important. You know, They're all engineering organizations at the end of the day. They're software and engineering. Yes, they know about marketing, but they don't know about our objectives, our challenges. They can't know about every category and the intricacies and idiosyncrasies of every category. So it's definitely a partnership to say, okay, we're buying what you've got, you kind of off the shelf products, but what does the future look like? How do we evolve the products together? Very, very different maybe from, from how some traditional media are evolved that's slightly, slightly less dynamic in the space, even if they are innovating. So we work with all of the partners. We are have the luxury, I guess, of, of being a, a bigger client. And so we get the opportunity to innovate with them or test new products. And that's always quite exciting because you know when you can test one, you can get access to things early on. So, you know, we got access to TikTok shop in the UK early on, which was quite exciting. So there's definite first mover advantage just to be able to learn with the partner. There's a bit of street cred. There's a bit of cut through. There's a bit of coolness there. So that helps helps the brands. You know, coming back to our earlier point about brand, you know, if you're the only brand doing something in a certain channel, then you stand out even more than, than everybody else doing that. There is a commercial component as well. You're right. You know, so I, I used to have that job at Facebook. I can't call them meta because it was just Facebook in those days. But, you know, so, and yeah, I, I had a quota of sales to do every month with a certain book of clients and you've got to keep them on, on track with that. So, so it's, it's a balance of saying, okay, how do you manage the commercial relationship? How does everybody get what they want out of it? And how do you keep innovating in a space? How do you understand what's going on and make the best use of it? And there are lots of really exciting things happening. You know, the speed of change at the moment is, is tremendous. You know, we can talk about influencers and advocacy. We can talk about e-commerce. We can talk about how those two mix together. There's so much going on there. So I'm going to come to some questions, actually, from, uh, from our students, from our audience. Um, so one of them, actually, just, just to, to come back to, to branding, uh, someone has asked sort of how, how do you evolve a brand, particularly long long-standing brands uh, where customers have long memories uh, or at least some customers I guess will, will have long memories um, and and so you've sort of got this 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 challenge of evolving a brand and making it relevant and, and you know relevant to today uh, while also staying true to I guess some of those those fond memories that that consumers have had that probably have kept them very loyal um, to the brand over time, um, and of course, there's then that challenge built into that. I guess of, you know, how do you grow a brand by acquiring new customers um, and being relevant to them without maybe uh, turning off the the existing customers that you certainly want to retain as well. So I think it's a good question about sort of, you know, present and future uh, with branding. So so how does that play? I think, I think there's a one word answer and then there's a long answer to this question. So I think that the, the first one is targeting. The targeting is the one of the miracles of, of digital advertising. There are probably a lot, but, but one of them is targeting, you know, starting to understand who the individual is at the other end and making sure that the content and the message is adapted to them. And so that does a lot of different things, but it means you can be different things to different groups. And, and so it's great, as you talked about, a brand that is kind of older and has, a, has an aging cohort you definitely want to keep those on. We know that older, older consumers tend to have more disposable income, but you need to recruit at the same time. And so you can recruit through targeting different people with a different message and, and start to stay on that. So I think that's probably the, 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 the initial point. But then all brands need to adapt, you know, because the challenge is that at the end of the day, everything becomes much of a sameness. So even with longstanding consumers, you're constantly needing to refresh, to reinforce certain elements of the brand, play up some, play down others, depending on what's, depending on what's happening at the moment. You know, uh, 
uh, you know, if we talk about skincare, for example, is a big move towards ingredients. Ingredients are really, really critical at the moment. We talk about retinol, we talk about hyaluronic acid. You know, these things are critical and, and every skincare brand needs to be on that and talk about it at differing levels that are depending on the consumer. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I think someone someone else has asked about examples of how L'Oreal is leveraging AI, but but I think your point about targeting, for example, and and, and also personalization of, of content, for example, for you know different different segments who might have different different types of relationships with your brands is 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 a, is a prime example of where you can use data and you can use the you know the, the the advertising platforms to your advantage to to reach the you know the right people with the right messages and the right types of content. Maybe maybe that's you know automated production of some of that content as well to personalize it a bit. And so, um, but I think, you know, the other point there around branding is, you know, it's, in, I don't think it's, it's true that any brand would want to stand still um, because the world doesn't stand still and you know, competitors probably aren't standing still, particularly startups who are, you know, find lower barriers to entry nowadays to, to enter into your categories. So to stay relevant, even to the sort of the very loyal customers, um, I, I guess the, the the desire to evolve is 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 very important, strategically um, critical to to do. Um, another couple of questions uh, that I'm going to bring up here. Um, I want to sort of move into to talking about sort of ethics and responsibility um, when it comes to to marketing. Um, and so um, you know, so maybe we start so with a fairly general question, which which has been asked, which is really you know how how do ethics play a part in marketing and actually how do, how do individuals' ethics, one, one's own sort of ethical lens, uh, play a part in how marketing is, um, is, is carried out? But I, think, I think every individual has their, has their principles and morals and then, and then the organisation as well. I think ethics plays an enormous part in, in how we talk to consumers. And for, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about this from a personal point of view, but obviously in the beauty space, L'Oreal thinks about that in a very specific way. You know, we, we have a concept called universalization and, and that means that we have products for everybody and everybody has a different view of beauty and everybody's view of beauty is relevant for our products. So I think from a, from a company point of view, we believe that and it's very, very strong for us. I think for me as a marketer, you know, ethics plays a super important role because we have to think about it as a gate every time we do something new. And, you know, as I talked about, kind of being in this sort of space of transformation, we've got to keep thinking, you know, I think the, the, the ethics around data is a really big deal at the moment. And then the next sort of, the next threshold is going to be around AI and that sort of thing, you know, as we start to collect people's information and what we do with it, you know, we've, so, we've all seen examples of sort of Twitter bots that have gone crazy or these sort of things, you know, we have to be super careful about how we let technology take over. I, I think ethics around data is a really interesting one because it's one that's already existing. It's quite mature, but it's growing and growing now. And you start to think about setting in place guidelines about what you do with people's data, how transparent you are to the consumer about what you're doing and what you're collecting. You know, the ICO in the UK, so, so that's the governing body around data privacy, that has a lot of work about saying, OK, we want to be at the forefront. We don't want to just be kind of alongside everybody else, standardized in terms of the legislative framework. We want to make sure we're protecting consumers. And that's alongside everything that's happening at Apple, everything that's happening at Google. So we look at those things, but, but my question to our data privacy team is always, you know, what's just beyond that? You know, what's the right point? You know, should we say we don't enrich or we won't buy data? You know, all these things that are definitely legal, but always a little bit strange. You know, you get a letter in the mail, you get an email and you think, well, how did they get my email address? How did they get my name? How did they get this data point about me? You know, I wouldn't, I, I prefer that consumers aren't asking that about us. I prefer it was transparent and they understand what they've opted in for and what they're getting. And then if we talk about AI, you know, it's an enormous space now in terms of ethics. You know, what do you, what do, you do with the data? What do you let the machine do? There's been a lot to talk about kind of artificial intelligence being programmed by non-diverse groups. And as a result, that bias coming through. So how do you make sure that's, that's present? And that kind of leads you into to HR and the populations and how we want our people to be a reflection of the community. So it's an enormous space and it's one that's really important. You know, we need to, we need to permanently be, be opening our minds to that. Every single type of unconscious bias, you know, there, there's, we talk a lot about recruiting there, but, it, but it's really much broader in the space of marketing. Well, yeah, and I mean, just, just on that last point about sort of ethics in, in AI and actually related to data as well, um, sort of shameless plug for, for, the, for the work that we've done in the Future of Marketing Initiative here around responsible um, AI, which is really a, a, you know, a practical ethics framework for, for the private sector to, to use in thinking about how you deal with ethical issues in, in AI. And so anyone who's watching 
um, you can you can find that on uh, on on the Future of Marketing Initiatives website or on the school website. Um, and it's a, a white paper that that walks through sort of principles of responsible AI for business. Um, and but but thinks about all these 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 sort of issues. It's not just about the algorithms. It, it's it's about the people. It's about the teams. It's about you know understanding implicit biases and removing them and, and so on and so forth. So it's a massive massive space. I guess the other space here and, and coming to some other questions that have come up which is from an ethical uh, standpoint is thinking about, you know, the industry that, that, that L'Oreal is in, which is, which is beauty and, and um, different, you know, portrayals of, of beautiful people, typically women with most of your, your brands um, and the implications that has for, for body image and, and, and uh, self-esteem and so on. And particularly in light of some of the things that have been coming out recently around um, Facebook and Instagram and, and, and what they, may or may not have known about how certain types of content on their platforms affect young people. Um, so, so what's, I guess, L'Oreal's sort of role in, you know, as a, as a, you know, a, a collection of, of beauty brands, but as a, just a good corporate citizen, I suppose, and an influential corporate citizen uh, in society to, to help lead the way forward on uh, making sure that, that what, what we're all doing is not inadvertently harmful to certain parts of society. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's two pieces there. You know, there's a piece about what we do and our communication and our product, and then, and then there's how we work with our partners. So I think, I mean, I think from a, from a commerce point of view, L'Oreal has always been very much on the, on the front foot on this for a long time, you know, not necessarily always related to digital, but the types of, types of models, celebrities that we portray in our communication. You, know, you said it's, it's mainly women. It's, it's broader than women these days. I think you'll, you'll find that on every brand, there's probably a man and now there are transgender or all of the other groups of society. So I think on the one hand, very representative of society and the consumers and this differently based on culture, religion, geography, all these different elements. So there is a, there's a representation piece. There's a piece about kind of how we show beauty and what beauty means. Um, and, and that's all around, you know, it's maybe not quite as far as Dove in terms of what Dove has done, but it's, it's, it's very much around reality and not retouching and showing how our products work on, on individuals. So I think that's the, that's the communication piece. It's, it's critically important. And we make sure, you know, we have a way of measuring the output on the flip side of what the consumer is seeing to make sure that it is representative and that it is going in the right direction. You, know, you can measure the inputs and you can measure the output. You need to look at both of those to make sure that it's working. On the flip side, you know, when it comes to partners, we we have so we have a quite a strong ethical charter in terms of how we work with all of our partners, not just in marketing and media, but, but across the board, suppliers, producers, all, all these different things. And it goes quite a long way down the value chain. So that's that's kind of how we work. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure I'm I'm competent enough to talk specifically about Facebook and whistleblowers and what they've done. I think we try to act as responsibly as possible on those platforms. We feed back to them and we have these discussions very openly with them in terms of what they're doing. Um, but it's clear, you know, if, 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 there are, if there are platforms that are blatantly abusing that, then, then we'll, we'll pull out and we'll make a stance. I don't think we've got to that stage yet. Yeah, and actually, yeah, back to what you're saying before about how, you know, you really do see the, the tech platforms as, as partners uh, in addition to sort of the, the, the commercial transactions, by I would imagine by being partners, it means that you can have those frank discussions with them about, hey, you know, we're not we're not we're not comfortable with certain things, but instead of just totally walking away, you know, it, it's it's about influencing those those platforms to change because, you know, they're not, you know, but certainly at least the 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 people that I know in those in those organizations, they're not sort of out there to destroy the world. They're um, they're not they're not, not collections of, of, of horrible evil people uh, they're, they're trying to, to to do their jobs and, and and to do them well and so I think you know it, it's a it's in some sense a business community effort and actually it's it's you know if we talk about um, sort of something you know things like stereotypes and bias and, and and you know inclusion and representation on the flip side of that in, in advertising you know this is this is an industry-wide uh, set of issues it, it shouldn't fall just on one, one one company uh, in in L'Oreal, uh, and indeed, actually, for everyone watching, it, it's it's something that the United Nations, no less, has has taken on. Um, and L'Oreal is is part of this. We are part of this as the side business school, and many other um, sort of large uh, players in in the advertising and marketing uh, and consumer goods industries are part of something called the Unstereotype Alliance, uh, 
um, which is a secretariat within the United Nations, and their mission is to um, get rid of harmful stereotypes in uh, advertising and marketing communications, but to do that in a in a positive and evidence based way. So uh, to sort of bring the bring all the key players together to to work on this, and indeed the tech platforms are, are part of this as well. So I think. Um, you know, my view is it, it's with these big issues, and we're going to come to another big issue in a second that that's the world is facing. Um, you, you can't just have one, you know, one company shouldering it uh, for everyone else, of course, but actually we're, we're stronger when we when we work together, even if that means in the case of, say, removing stereotypes from advertising, it means that, um, you know, cutthroat competitors are actually getting together to to come up with with you know collective values and standards uh, around these sorts of sorts of things. Um, so the other issue, the next big issue I was going to bring up is uh, sustainability. And so someone has asked about the focus on sustainability and how has that changed the way that we we think about marketing. Um, so not not a tiny topic, and again something where you know collective action is important. Um, but but within the world of L'Oreal. Um, Lex, what, what's, what's going on on the sustainability front uh, at the moment? So it's an interesting one. How do I, I just try and tackle this in three pieces. I think there is one, you know, what are the L'Oreal programs and plans? But maybe before that, there is, you know, what, what does sustainability mean? Because I think we, we as a consumer, as individuals, we tend to cons- sort of consolidate sustainability equals green. And that's great. And there's a lot of work going on around around green at the moment. And that's probably where we've been strongest and and communicated most. Um, So we had, excuse me, we had a a program called Sharing Beauty with All for a long time that came to an end. And that was relaunched as L'Oreal for the future by our our, our outgoing CEO, who's now our chairman. So those are the those are the very big high level programs. And you can read about them online on our websites. And those are really kind of the programs that guide the organization to where we're going. And and L'Oreal's L'Oreal is a great organization because we don't necessarily always communicate massively about what we're doing, but we've been on board with this for quite a long time. It's, it's a humble organization in that sense. I'm really doing very well in terms of, you know, whether it's water management, whether it's recycled plastics, whether it's use of packaging in general, whether it's point of sale, all of these different elements we can optimize. I think, I think there's the broader view of sustainability, which is, you know, what, what creates a sustainable business for the future? And, you know, that links back to how do we evolve brands? It, it touches everything, you know, it touches on our people, you know. A sustainable business is one that is strong and can live longer, but isn't necessarily doing harm in it and is evolving to the environment. And I think that has a very big impact on people, the type of people we recruit, the type of consumers we have, how we train them, how we educate them. And we're doing a lot of work on that internally and externally. You know, it touches on representation and advertising to make sure that all consumer groups are, are touched and we have relevant products for everybody, depending on what their vision of beauty is. So, so I think, I mean, I, I would recommend everybody to look at L'Oreal for the future. It's an enormous program based on these sort of these seven pillars of what are the capacity of the planet and where are we going? Um, a couple of examples, maybe just before we go on to the next question, you know, I, I'm really intrigued and I'm, I'm a marketer. I'm not in production, but I'm really intrigued by our, our production facilities. We don't have any in the UK, but I used to work across the Africa, Middle East. We have a very modern factory in Egypt, just outside Cairo. You know, some of our facilities are water free now. So a closed water loop, you know, they're cleaning water. Some of them, even in the developing markets, putting cleaner water back into the environment than what's coming in. So that's really quite interesting. Then we acquired uh, a brand called Mugler that has a bunch of fragrances just, just recently. And, you know, they have a refill program. And that's really exciting because if you think about fragrance and the bottle it comes in, you know, it's, it's, it's a key part of the product but it's probably not the most sustainable piece. So, so creating refill programs like that. And there's just a couple of examples. You know, we've worked with TerraCycle to create closed loop for all makeup brands. So you can recycle makeup brand packaging because makeup packaging is extremely complex, you know, the plastics, the colors. So I think across the board, there are activities everywhere around that kind of sustainable packaging piece. And then there is thinking more broadly about what sustainability means and how we need to evolve our business to, to stay at the forefront of that. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's sort of, a, again, as a sort of an outsider looking in, I think one thing that L'Oreal has been doing for a long time, actually, is sort of just quietly going about this. Um, whereas, you know, maybe some other, other companies in, in adjacent categories uh, like to shout from the rooftops uh, about it um, and back up those claims, uh, to be fair. But, but L'Oreal's sort of been a quiet achiever, I guess, on, on this front, um, which is interesting, though, because, you know, you sort of alluded to sort of how this 
comes then into thinking about the brands and actually what consumers want. And, and as you know, Lex, some of our research has, has sort of shown, well, it's sort of good to be good. And, and in, in some sense, what's been driving growth in, in brand equity and actually also financial returns for, for brands um, increasingly has become being perceived by the market, by consumer markets as being, you know, environmentally and socially responsible, you know, sort of a sustainable, purposeful, responsible um, business. And so and if, I think, you know, it pays if, off. If I, if I might, you know, because you've got a class of, of, of budding geniuses in marketing, I think one of our challenges has been is that the L'Oreal Group as an organization has been, as you say, quietly moving forward with all of these for a long time. But we have a portfolio of kind of 30 to, to 50 brands. It's sometimes difficult to connect what the parent company is doing with each of the brands, particularly in our category where each brand has an individual personality. And that's probably a communications challenge. You know, we haven't necessarily done exactly the same thing as a Unilever or a PNG who can sign each of their products with the parent company because we're in this emotional category. You know, I'm not sure that everybody would like to know that a Japanese brand like Shuemura, an American brand like Maybelline, uh, and a French brand like Garnier all come from the same parent organization. Yeah, and, and so I think bringing it, bringing it down to that brand level uh, is... is is actually what you know I think is the big challenge for a lot of companies actually to, to go from sort of big corporate initiatives um, that you know are, are legitimate and real and 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 impactful in their own ways, but actually to bring it bring it to life at the sort of where the rubber meets the road in terms yeah. of where where the, the brands and products touch the the customers directly, which is uh, you're right I think a fundamentally a, a sort of, well, I'd say it's a communications challenge, but it's also a sort of a marketing strategy and brand strategy challenge to think about how do you make, how do you embed, you know, some facet of sustainability really into the core of what, what makes a brand tick uh, and, and in a way that resonates with consumers. So it's not, because again, you know, you also don't want it to look like you're just sort of tacking it on for the sake of it and, and greenwashing and, and so on. So it's a- We've done a campaign recently around the world, actually. So, so most of your students will probably have seen somewhere other that talks about creating the beauty that moves the world, signed L'Oreal. But in our research, it shows that it's only L'Oreal Paris and L'Oreal Pro, the two brands of the portfolio that hold the name that are really benefiting from that. So there's, there's still work to do that. Yeah, and so we're just conscious of time. A few more things that I wanted to bring up, but uh, there's, a, there's a question that someone asked about uh, how L'Oreal goes about assessing new or emerging technologies, for example, augmented reality. But I want to use the example of metaverse here, since I, I promised we would we would come to it. Um, you know, so sort of how, how do you assess this and decide, and, you know, there, there, there's one thing about experimenting and playing, basically, but there's also the the sort of the business reality of, you know, there's there's not an infinite budget for these things. And, and, and you know, you want to at some point make a, a, a hard business decision on whether or not you you invest or not in, a, in an emergent technology at a given point in time. Um, so, so how do you go about that? Um, or, yeah, I'm sure there are several ways of going about that, but what, what are some of the ways that, that you see as working pretty well? I wish I could say that there was a, there was a perfect playbook for that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there is. I think there are a bunch of things that, that we take into account. So I think one, you know, with, with all due respect to Oxford and the academic institution, you know, as human beings, one of the challenges of the human condition is that you only really learn through experience. And so we have to do things, you know, we have to do it, feel the pain points, feel what doesn't work, you know, you, you try something and then it doesn't, doesn't always look as good as you expected it to look. So, so there's a lot of testing that goes on. We talked about this, you talked about innovation, but, but trial and error, failing fast, uh, we don't fail fast enough, you know, we're not very good at saying this didn't work, we need to stop this. But I think part of it is that what we want to make sure, you know, what, what I do and my team does is to make sure we're not testing the same thing across 30 something different brands, you know, that's a waste of time. So it's about kind of distributing the risk and say, okay, well, you're gonna try this and you're gonna try this and then we'll come together and analyze. So I think the first thing is, is getting firsthand experience of what's going on. There's a little trick, which I, which I have to say, because you're talking about these things, you know, First mover advantage is quite interesting. You know, when it comes to media formats, you know, some of the media players, they tend to push new media formats a little bit more. You know, the algorithm upweights it slightly because they want uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, when, when Zuckerberg and Meta, I'm getting my head around it, you know, talked about they were gonna be the number one platform for video. It was funny how video content seemed to be higher up the feed than everybody else's. You know, they wanted to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's a, there's a trick there in terms of, you know, testing and, and, and being the first. Then to come back to a point, earlier, you know, some critical thinking to understand what exactly do you want this to do and is it really working? 
you know, am I touching the right audience? You know, I think TikTok's really exciting. For a long time, we thought TikTok was all very, very young individuals. And so then you need to somehow find the right way to measure and say, okay, am I touching the right target audience? Or do I know that it's touching a very young segment? And then I need to, I need to work on it like that. So, so some fundamentals and some critical thinking to measure. And, and I think being very objective about that, I think what's really important is that we don't get too emotional and say, this was mine and it has to work and it has to be perfect. You know, kind of, uh, we, we used to do something called nights which was great you know it was beer and pizza and, and and talking about failures you know you learn so much more from pain and failure really than you do from success you kind of gloss over success so so that's why i don't i don't think there's a perfect process you know being able to test things making sure that we use our scale not to test everybody on the same thing failing fast critical objectivity and then sharing learnings to be able to sort of fail faster the next time yeah and i, I think it also helps um i think i think in all of that to have healthy skepticism along the way that isn't that isn't sort of the the roadblock to trying but but you know you I mean I, I always think of it as if I had someone on the team who's just sort of that naysayer they're not going to stop it but they're going to always be the the sort of the devil's advocate or or just straight up sort of skeptic I think that helps push uh push push the team further to really to really have good answers to those fundamental business questions of like why are we doing this who is it for what returns are we expecting to get? What's the horizon uh, for those returns, uh, and and so on. So I think it's about uh, you know get, getting a good mix of people as well. Um, we're pretty much out of time, but I wanted to end on one one final question, which someone has has asked. Which uh, curious what your thought is. So it's sort of how do you define marketing? But but the question is really saying you know here at, at Oxford Said we we talk a lot about marketing as as a driver of growth. Um, but how is that balance with sustainability? I guess the person asking the question is thinking that these, these two things are at odds with each other. I would certainly contend that they're not, but uh, they wanna know what you think, Lex, in terms of growth as, as something that marketing is responsible for, but we also wanna be, uh, I guess, sustainable and responsible um, as well. So how do we merge it all together? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I would recommend looking at what you can for L'Oreal. I think L'Oreal is a prime example of decoupling sustainability and growth. You know, the group has over the last 10 years, I think, you know, under the under the reign, if I can say that, of Jean-Paul Lagon, really managed to show that these extra financial measures can grow at the same time as the group. So I think we are a case in point and we're not the only one by any means who have managed to decouple growth and, and sustainability. So I think that's the first point. It is possible. And, and as you've said, Andrew, you know, we, we know that, that being good and being green is good for business as well. So being sustainable is good for business. I think that's the first point. What, what is the objective of marketing? Marketing is probably a combination of different things. I, I would agree the first one's got to be growth. You know, that is the objective. You know, we look to grow market share. We look to grow our size, our brands, our penetration. But I think there's a point about the consumer that doesn't always come in there. You know, we've got to drive value for the consumer. That might be utilitarian. That might be entertainment. That might be something else. might be about well-being. So I think thinking about the consumer and adding value to their lives, particularly as we go forward now and we think about brands with purpose, so I think it's growth with purpose and growth with value for consumers. Yeah, as I like to say, human-centric marketing with purpose, which sounds very academic, but, but you said it much better than me. Um, all right, so we are out of time, everybody. So uh, Lex, thank you so much for, for taking some time on this Monday morning to, to join us. Um, really, really appreciate your thoughts on, on everything uh, that we've discussed. Um, there are many, many more questions than we than we unfortunately had time for, but uh, but uh, hopefully um, we managed to to cover a lot of what uh, you all watching uh, were interested in uh, today. So um, you know, for me, that's it. Thanks very much um, again, Lex. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, everybody.